fair warning, if you are a Bills or a Dolphins fan, this episode is going to be very long and very complicated and irredeemably nerdy when it comes to the X's and O's in football. But if you stick with me to the end, I promise you're gonna learn something new about your team that you didn't know before. As you could probably tell, I'm recording this from my hotel room in Miami in yet another makeshift set because that's just how we're starting the season this year. And I've come all the way to South Florida to watch this game in person so that I can test a theory. That theory is that the Dolphins finally have the answer to some of the schematic nightmares that Josh Allen has been giving them. They famously got absolutely ripped apart in 2020, which was kind of Josh Allen's coming out party, so to speak. We know that part well. But what people might not realize is that last year in 2021, at least in terms of pass defense, the Dolphins played pretty well overall against Allen, and they actually put some really interesting things on tape for how to handle this Bills passing game. So what I'm gonna do is take this episode in three parts. Part one, I'm gonna show you the problem the Dolphins were having with Allen before. Part two, I'm gonna show you how they solved some of those problems last year. And part three, we're gonna go to the game and then break down what happened this year to see if their answers from 2021 hold up. I think they will hold up personally, but you know, Josh Allen is Josh Allen, and sometimes he has the remarkable ability to bury you anyway, even when you call the right defense, because, well, he's a fucking freak of nature, and that's just what those types of people do. So, regardless, let's get to the film, because I know that's why you're really here. Let's start with the main problem that Miami was having with Josh Allen and the Bills going back a couple of years, and that's crossing routes. In what many people consider to be the famous coming out party for Allen, week two of the 2020 season was a complete disaster for the Dolphins. They invested a lot of resources in their secondary that offseason, both in terms of money and draft capital, and they really wanted to just line up and cover one, put a deep safety in the post, play man coverage across the board, and just kind of out-talent everyone. But there was a problem with that against Buffalo in that they could not out-talent the Bills. More specifically, they couldn't out-talent Josh Allen because he could punish all of those single high safety man coverage looks with incredible throws on those deep crossing routes. For people that have watched this channel for a long time and seen my previous work on the Bills offense, you already know most of this. But for the new faces around here, crossing routes are the number one way that a modern offense likes to punish most single high safety man coverage structures. And it's one of their favorites because it stresses out the corners who are in man coverage and have to try to keep up with an inside breaking route that is notorious for being extremely hard to keep up with in man. Plus, it's going to put those single high safeties in a bind as well by forcing them to choose which crossing route to bracket over the top or potentially having a third option of needing to bracket the deep post behind those crossing routes. So no matter what the safety chooses, he's gonna be wrong because he can only give inside help to one route. And with Allen's natural arm talent, he can kind of hit any of those throws from any depth, from any platform. All day long, Buffalo was able to hit deep cross after deep cross and punish those man coverage looks. And Miami never really adjusted to it by calling any of the coverages in their arsenal that are actually good against those types of play calls. However, fast forward to week two of the very next season in 2021, and Miami came better prepared. They knew that in second and long situations, or in first down situations inside of what's known as shot territory between the 40 yard line markers, the Bills love to resort to those crossing routes when they see a man coverage look. So, Miami gave them almost exactly what they wanted to see in those situations, which was a sort of man coverage look. This is from early in that first 2021 game on first down inside of shot territory, and the Dolphins are teasing either a match quarters look, which is basically zone coverage but with man coverage principles, or it could just be straight up cover five, which is man coverage but with two high safeties on the back end. Either way, Allen is keeping this play on without checking out of it, and some people would call it wave, some would call it spear, some would call it jumbo mesh. I don't really care what your preferred name for it is, it's all the same thing, but again, it just comes down to overlapping crossing routes over the middle with a go ball to the field side as an alert and two check down options underneath. The entire purpose of this play, especially in this down and distance, is to get a big chunk of yardage by trying to put these DBs in conflict on those crossing routes. And Miami knows that, so the coverage they called here is not actually quarters, and it's not cover five, it's not anything like that, it's actually what's known as cover one cross. Some would call it cover one robber, but that's a slightly different thing in my opinion, and I'll go over the differences a little bit later in this show, but I personally know it as cover one cross. 
Again, if you've been around this channel for a while, you already know what this is, but for the new folks, cover one cross is when you present a two high safety shell pre-snap, you've got man coverage all across the board underneath, and then you rotate down one of those deep safeties to play in this intermediate hole zone over the middle in order to provide extra support against crossing routes. Typically, that safety is also going to be in charge of communicating with his corners and telling them which one of their routes he's going to cut, just like you see him doing here. And then once that route is cut by the safety, the corner that was covering that receiver then zones off and replaces that safety as the whole zone helper over the middle, and then he will cut whatever the next route is to come into that zone. That's exactly what you see from Byron Jones here. The first crosser gets cut, and then he immediately peels off on replacement duty and undercuts Diggs as the second man through. And then meanwhile, right as he undercuts Diggs, Allen has already let this ball go because he thought he was just going to have an easy one-on-one. -on -one. And in my opinion, he was extraordinarily lucky that Jones dropped what should have been a sure interception. Allen absolutely got away with one there, but the key point to take away is that this particular coverage was Miami's answer for this particular situation. They called it no fewer than six times against Buffalo in second or third and long situations or on those first down shot plays from midfield. And even though it didn't explicitly force an incompletion every single time, it did, however, keep Buffalo from hitting any of those explosive plays through the air that they're used to which is really what Miami was going for. The same could be said for the rematch later in the 2021 season in week eight, but in that game, Miami actually played less straight up man coverage and went with a more match zone heavy approach with lots of quarters coverage or rotations from quarters pre-snap into cover three post-snap. And in either case, those two high safety looks or rotations out of two high safety looks they all kind of accomplished the same thing as that week two game in that Miami secondary was always allocating their safeties to driving on any crossing routes over the middle and making their outside corners jobs as easy as possible. Were any of these adjustments to that first bombardment from 2020 that complicated, all things considered? No, not really, nor were they actually innovative because this coverage has been around forever and teams have been using it against the Chiefs to try to slow down Mahomes since at least 2019, arguably 2018. But despite that lack of originality, these defensive calls were effective. And in back-to-back -back games in 2021, the Dolphins held Josh Allen to less than 250 yards a game, less than six yards per attempt, and two touchdowns or fewer in each game. Obviously, it should be noted that the run defense in particular in those games left a little bit to be desired, especially in the week two matchup. But the passing defense overall was very, very good. And typically speaking, if your pass defense is playing at an elite level against the Bills, who outright refuse to run the ball at times anyway, you always at least have a shot to win. All right, so in a nutshell, those are at least a few of the main problems that Miami has been dealing with every time they've had to play against Allen for the last couple of years. And those are at least a few of the ways that they've deployed their defense to handle those problems. So now that the stage is set and you understand all of the context going into this game and all of these schematic nuances, we only have one thing left to do, and that's to actually go to the game so that we can come back here and break down all of Buffalo's adjustments to Miami's adjustments to Buffalo's adjustments. Like I said, this episode's very complicated, so uh, let's just get to it. Well, uh, that was not what I expected. I definitely thought the Dolphins were going to win. I didn't think they were going to win like that. And I really didn't think the Bills were going to lose like that. A whole bunch of wild shit happened in that game that I don't know if I've ever seen before. But uh, there's a first time for everything. Also, by the way, if you didn't notice, it's dark as hell outside. And it's the daytime because uh, the tail end of Hurricane Ian decided to hit about 20 minutes before I started recording this. So... We'll see what happens. I've been holed up in my hotel room watching film of this game all day so that I can talk about what just happened and try to explain it all to you. Uh, whether or not I catch my flight home tomorrow, 
I guess we'll see, but uh, for now, let's dive into the film. I'll explain what's going on and maybe if we can try to take something away from this long term. Before I do that though, I need to pay some bills really quick and thank the sponsor that helped to make this trip possible in the first place and send me out here, and that is Factor. Factor makes meeting your nutrition goals easier than ever by delivering fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your door. All Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat in just two minutes, which is perfect for busy days when you don't have time to cook, but you still want something that tastes good and is healthy that you can just toss in the microwave. Their menus are updated weekly and include 27 plus meals and 33 plus add-on options, plus you can choose your favorite meals or let Factor craft your order based on your taste preferences and meal history. At least for me, last week I was a really big fan of the buffalo chicken with the pepper jack cauliflower mash because, as per usual, the chicken was really tender and the cauliflower mash, believe it or not, was also really good too, even though, again, it's vegetables in a microwavable meal. It's all just way better than it has any right to be. And the smoothies that come with our package are really good as well. It's about 120 calories for a plant-based protein smoothie that's really filling, it tastes great, and it's a perfect snack option if you don't want a full meal. So if you yourself are looking for really quick meal options to get you through a hectic day, I think Factor is definitely worth giving a try just to see if you like it. And if you do want to try it out, you can use my promo code by heading to go.factor75.com slash filmroom130 and use promo code filmroom130 to get $130 off. Again, that is go.factor75.com slash filmroom130, promo code filmroom130 for $130 off. Thank you again to Factor for sponsoring today's show, and with that, let's get back to it. All right, so there's one main thing that you need to take away from last week's Dolphins and Bills matchup, and it's that the cat and mouse game between Ken Dorsey and Josh Boyer, who's the DC for the Dolphins, that was incredible stuff. These are easily two of the top minds in football at any level going at it for four straight quarters, and this distinct battle had four different phases to it. Phase one was the Bills coming out with some really nice adjustments to Miami's famous cover zero blitzes that everyone always talks about. Phase two was Miami's adjustments to Buffalo's adjustments. Phase three was Buffalo's adjustments to the adjustments to the adjustments. And then phase four was the Dolphins coaching staff saying, fuck it, we're not doing that anymore. Instead, we're going to play all of the spiciest versions of cover two that we can think of and dare you not to throw picks. And I'll be damned. Josh Allen almost threw a lot of picks into those different variations of cover two. So let's get into phase one first here, which is how Buffalo handled Miami's zero blitz on the first snap of the game when they got a huge gainer to Stephon Diggs. To first understand this play though, we need to rewind seven days to this almost touchdown from the Ravens offense at the end of their week two matchup. You see, a cover zero blitz is actually relatively simple by design. You've got man coverage all across the board, typically in off alignment, about seven to eight yards off their receivers. And mathematically, you're always gonna have one more rusher up front on the line of scrimmage than the offense can physically block. In this case, it's seven rushers against six protectors. And just like the design of the defense, the ways for an offense to handle this look are also relatively simple. Either A, you can find a way to get even numbers of blockers on the rushers so you can block it up and then take advantage of the one-on-one -on -one matchups down the field, or B, they can just concede that they can't block them all, and then they can just try to get the ball out quick with something else like a screen or throwing to a hot receiver and trying to get some yards after catch. For option A though, the hard part of trying to block it up and take a deep shot one-on-one -on -one is that every time you bring a receiver or a tight end back into the core of the formation to be another blocker, the DB covering that receiver now has license to just add on as yet another rusher so that the defense always has a plus one advantage in the pass rush. Baltimore has a very fun way of handling that particular problem though, and ironically, if you watch my episode last season on this exact matchup where the Ravens had difficulty dealing with Miami's blitzes, this was one of the ways that I talked about as an effective way to potentially handle it. What they do here is they bring Isaiah Likely across the formation with motion at the snap as a late additional blocker in order to even up the numbers in the box at the very last second. 
And because they brought Likely in as that late additional blocker without really tipping the hand that he was going to be blocking, the DB is now out in no man's land because he's not blitzing. He didn't know that Likely was going to be protecting, so he didn't come up and try to rush himself. So he's just staying back in coverage, but not actually covering anyone because, again, Likely stayed in the block. So he's just kind of floating out there pretty much just guarding grass with nothing to do. Meanwhile, the Ravens are able to get seven blockers on seven rushers right at the snap, and Mark Andrews is able to go deep off the double move against the safety because that safety was not expecting Lamar to be upright long enough to go deep in the first place. So long story short, Baltimore got the exact matchup they wanted against the exact look they wanted, but unfortunately for them, Lamar missed the throw deep, so the pass ended up incomplete anyway. However, all of that being said, Buffalo absolutely learned from this one play on tape, even though it didn't work, and they integrated the exact same plan in their own Week 3 game plan when they faced Miami, starting on the very first play. Once again, you can see the Dolphins in their classic Blitz Zero alignment, and the Bills respond by bringing Dawson Knox across the formation with motion at the snap as a late additional blocker, which then gives them six blockers against six rushers, all the other receivers on islands in man coverage, and the fifth DB is once again out in no man's land doing virtually nothing. The matching of numbers in the box to pick up that blitz is then rewarded because Stephon Diggs wins inside on the post route, and Allen hits him for a huge gain to get their opening drive going, which of course ultimately led to a touchdown. Not to be outdone though, in phase two of this battle between Ken Dorsey and Josh Boyer, Boyer then adjusted his blitz zero approach on the very next drive so that now every DB that was covering any receiving option within the core of the formation, instead of hanging around in off coverage, they would be packed in tight around the line of scrimmage instead so that even if Buffalo was going to try to bring in those extra blockers off of motion, it would be much easier for those DBs to still blitz anyway and not get stuck in no man's land so that the defense would go back to being plus one in the rush. That even more aggressive approach to an already aggressive coverage then made sure that Allen did not have time to just sit back in the pocket and hit Gabe Davis deep on another post. And with Boyer dialing up that aggression, it came with a gorgeous strip sack from Javon Holland off the edge, which of course set Miami up for a touchdown of their own. That punch and counterpunch early between the Bills and Dolphins was really fun to watch, especially if you're already very familiar with what they like to do schematically. But trust me, that was just the first quarter. We are not even close to done. In phase three of this schematic battle, Buffalo adjusted again about midway through the first quarter, and they switched their own approach from trying to block up everything and winning deep against cover zero to just outright giving up on trying to match blocking numbers at all and instead opting to throw hot into that pressure and punish Miami's aggression with yards after the catch. Over and over again, they were able to either hit Devin Singletary or Stephon Diggs as hot receivers off the corner and pick up Yak, and they were able to punish the Dolphins so thoroughly whenever they dialed up those blitzes that by about four minutes into the second quarter, Josh Boyer stopped calling Blitz Zero almost entirely. He literally only called it one more time for the remainder of the game, but for the other 60 or so plays, he stayed away from blitzing, and he changed his plan once again to something very uncharacteristic for what we normally expect from the Dolphins' defense. He called cover two, and I mean he called a lot of cover two. This is the same defense that, historically speaking, over the previous two seasons, they only call cover two about 6% of the time across all defensive snaps. But from the second quarter onward in that game against Buffalo last weekend, they called it 30% of the time. And what was really the most entertaining part of that to me was how they got into those cover two looks. They never outright showed the Bills that they were in a two deep shell, and they always got into it from some other pre-snap look. Hell, there were even times where they would show Blitz Zero before the snap and try to spook them into reacting to it, and they would invite those very same throws to hot receivers that burned them before, only to then back out into cover two and have a whole host of defenders available to rally and tackle in space, plus getting a free rusher off the edge with only a four-man rush anyway. I mean, some of the ways that Boyer was able to get into these Tampa 2 looks were downright batshit insane in terms of the amount of movement post-snap that was required from his DBs. Javon Holland, in particular, probably ran a half marathon during this game, but I'll tell you what, it worked. 
Josh Allen never knew where the pressure was coming from or how many rushers were coming, and with two deep safeties over the top and seven total bodies in coverage, it was extremely hard for him to push the ball down the field like he normally wants to. Allen was forced to check down or take quick throws over and over and over again, and you could tell by the middle of the second half, the frustration of not being able to go deep really got to him. And that frustration, in my opinion, was what gave Miami their chance to win this game. As you all know, Josh Allen is not someone who likes to be put into a box. If you tell him, look, you can throw five yards all day long, but you're not allowed to throw 20 yards, he's not just going to take the five yards the entire game. He's going to say, fuck you, I'm Josh Allen, I'm going to throw that whole shot whether you like it or not, and that honestly is where he can get into trouble sometimes. Allen, believe it or not, had five passes in this game that were either outright dropped interceptions or balls that went straight through the hands of a DB. I mean, that is five near picks. You don't expect that from an elite quarterback. And arguably, the two most egregious drop picks were where he tried to put on that superhero cape and he wanted a hole shot from the far hash against cover two, which, to be honest, most of the time that ball has no prayer of being complete. Hell, I could even argue that there was a sixth ball that could have been picked off against a cover two-ish style coverage and pressure, and it's one that reminds me a lot of something that Kirby Smart calls Crash Bird Dog, though it's more of a Tampa 2 version of Smart's Bird Dog coverage look, but anyway, that's not important. I don't want to get bogged down by jargon. What is important is that this linebacker who's running the seam here in this version of Tampa 2, if he just turned his head around and looked for the ball, that very easily could have been another interception. Long story short, I know that the Bills were supremely injured on defense heading into that game, and of course the heat conditions of the game itself only exacerbated their issues, especially on the offensive line, but the fact remains that relatively early in that game, again about four minutes into the second quarter, once that point arrived where the Dolphins stopped calling Blitz Zero, the Bills only put up three offensive points over the next 41 minutes of game time. Allen threw the ball 47 more times over that time period, and he completed less than 60% of those throws. He had a measly 5.3 yards per attempt, and he had no fewer than four passes that should have been picked, and you could argue up to six of them. I'm not saying that Allen is not an elite quarterback. Obviously, he is. This is not an anti-Josh Allen episode, and I would never be stupid enough to make one of those. And I'm not even saying that cover two is somehow the magical cure to beating him, because it's not. But what I am saying is that if you spend all summer long with your DBs installing every deranged, maniacal way possible that mankind has ever invented to get into cover two without ever tipping your hand pre-snap, well, yeah, that's probably a good way to beat Josh Allen. Will it work again in the rematch later this season? To be honest, I have no idea. So I suppose we'll just have to watch and find out. All right, boys and girls, that's all I got for you today. Hopefully you learned a little something about all of the different adjustments that coaches make against each other, not just on a weekly basis, but on a yearly basis, truth be told, especially when these stabs are very familiar with what each other likes to do. There's a lot that goes into coaching professional football and playing professional football. So hopefully you gleaned something from all this. If I need to make another installment later this year for their rematch in terms of explaining all of the adjustments to the adjustments to the adjustments to the adjustments, to the adjustments, I think that's enough layers. I will happily make that part three to this, uh, but for now, I'm just gonna concentrate on catching my flight home and trying to get the hell out of here before this storm gets any worse. So hopefully I see you guys later this week or at minimum next week. And uh, until then, later.